All right, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you again to Rachel for facilitating and to Brooke for doing closed captioning. Today we're gonna talk about building pollinator habitat in cities and towns. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge any Xerces Society members that are on the call. Thank you for your support, as well as our many funders that make our work possible. If you're not familiar with the Xerces Society, here's a little information on um, our organization. We've been working for about 50 years now on invertebrate conservation. And I are, we are a not-for-profit organization and our motto is to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and our habitats. So as you may know, you know, our invertebrates are keystone species in our ecosystems and a lot of other animals up the food chain depend on them. Um, we'll talk a little bit about those relationships today. One thing that we do pride ourselves on is that the advice we give and the work we do and the decisions we make are science based. So we work with other diverse partners, including scientists, land managers, educators, policymakers, farmers, and citizens to really have a well rounded conservation program. We get our name from this butterfly here. This is the Xerces blue butterfly. This butterfly um, used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area where it was tied to some unique habitat in that region. Um, unfortunately, through the development of that area, that habitat was removed from the landscape and this species is now extinct. So we use that as our reminder, as our poster child, to fight for these small animals, to not let that happen, and to make sure that we have our voice and that these little things have as much voice as larger animals, right? So when we think about wildlife conservation, we often think of big uh, furry megafauna, things like polar bears, right? These little animals are just as important, but often overlooked. Um, my role uh, typically with Circes is I'm working within the pollinator conservation and ag biodiversity team. So more often than not, I'm working on larger habitat installations on farms, preserves, land trusts, um, those types of landscapes. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, different landscapes, which I'm excited about, uh, but a lot of the same concepts apply. If you wanna learn more about our other programs, such as our endangered species program, our aquatic invertebrate conservation program, urban conservation, some of our community science programs, please visit our website. There is a just enormous amount of information there. We can't cover it all today, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. And to start, I'd like to get to know who's on the other end here and why you may be joining this um, webinar. So we're gonna do two poll questions. Um, Rachel has a poll set up here, so uh, the first question is, and do I need to initiate this here? I can take care of it if okay. you'd like. To. There we go. The first question is, are you interested in organizing a community-based effort, wherever you may be, to create a pollinator conservation action plan for your city or town or burg or whatever type of community you describe yours as? Um, the answers available are yes, I'm already doing this or part of one. I'd participate or contribute, but maybe not be the organizer. Not sure or no. So let's take a minute to answer those. Okay, let's see what we have here. Okay, 26% said yes, 31% said I'm already part of one. Yay, that's the biggest percentage. So I am so happy to hear this. Um, another 26 said they would participate or contribute. 13% are not sure and 4% said no. Um, it, 
that is a nice breakdown. And we'll, we'll, we'll give examples for how you can do this at the community level, but also the personal level um, individually. Let's go to the next question. Here, let's see here. Why is my screen not changing? There we go. Um, so pretend that you did say yes to question one, um, or for those of you that are already involved, you can comment that way. Um, you're now part of a committee tasked with creating a pollinator conservation action plan. What would be the highest priority in the plan for your city or town? So if you had to identify one thing, such as protecting or restoring wild spaces, pollinator-friendly landscaping in parks, recreation areas, shared spaces, et cetera. Having a program that converts lawns to native plant communities. Invasive species control, reducing insecticide use. Education, building climate resilient communities or other. And if you have other that you wanna type into the comments, that would be fine. And I know there's a lot of overlap here. Um, but I'm just trying to get an idea of what's important to this audience. Oh, yes. Okay, a lot of people want to convert lawn to native plant communities. That ranked in at 35%. Um, pollinator friendly landscaping is second, restoring wild spaces third, and then the rest is distributed among the other answers. 6% um, invasive species control, reducing insecticide use 2%. I know it's hard to just pick one. Uh, education, 10%, building climate re resilient communities for, and other, I saw um, somebody comment, local government buy-in. So that is important, and we have worked on, um, worked with people and communities on plans that included, you know, integrating them into local legislation. So we do have opportunities and examples on our website of those plans. Okay, let's get started here. So you probably are already familiar with this, but pollinators are in need of conservation action um, sooner now, right? We're already seeing declines at an alarming rate. In particular, we know that about a quarter of our bumblebee species are threatened at some level. Uh, we have one species, the rusty patched bumblebee that is on the endangered species list and several others that are approaching um, that status. Over 17% of all North American butterflies are at risk. Several species there that are considered endangered and protected. Monarch butterfly populations have declined 90% in just two decades, um, which is very concerning. And these declines include habitat specialists like the Xerxes blue butterfly I mentioned earlier, but also formal, formally common and widespread species. And at some point, you know, at some level, we expect very rare species to disappear. Um, not that that's a good thing, but when we see common species declining at such a rate, that is very worrisome. And there's a lot of factors that contribute to pollinator declines habitat loss, poor land management, resource competition, pesticide risks, disease, climate change, and more. So today we're gonna to be focusing on habitat loss, um, but I just wanna mention it's not just pollinators facing um, these declines. An increasing number of studies show insect declines around the world. 24% uh, decline in insect abundance over 30 years. And if we look back um, over the last 75 years, we see that number is 50%, right? Um, this is also happening to other animals too, birds, mammals. So we really need to do something in our landscapes to be able to support these species. 
we as humans take a lot from our landscape. We expect it to give us things like food, products like timber, um, places to live, and we really need to think about how we need to give back to keep these landscapes resilient over time. Widespread habitat loss is one of the main drivers of pollinator declines and the decline of other animals. And this can include complete removal of habitat like you see in this picture here to develop or build things like roads, infrastructure, degraded habitat. So um, habitats get changed, native plant communities may be displaced or fragmented, invasive species spread, again, displacing native plant communities and natural ecosystems, land use change, development, energy sprawl, loss of farmland, loss of these open spaces to development, monoculture agriculture, and just overall loss of biodiversity. And there could be more added to the list here. Um, in particular, we lose just one example here. We lose about 5,000 acres per day to real estate and energy development alone. That doesn't include farming and land use change and some of these others, which would put that acre loss um, up to very, very, very high numbers, which we don't want to continue to see, right? Um, <clears throat> conservation basics. When we want to talk about conserving or building habitat for animals. Uh, we need to know how to convince people to do that. So what's the value of doing it? What's the value of pollinators in this case? What does pollinator diversity look like? And what do those species need? The importance of maintaining diverse pollinator populations, biology and life cycles, habitat needs, and how you can help. We're gonna go over these today briefly. Uh, pollinators are keystone species. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when I was doing the introduction, the plants they pollinate, you know, rely on pollinators. About 85% of our flowering plants require a third party pollinator, an animal. And that animal here in our region is usually an insect. And that insect is usually a bee. Um, but we have a lot of other animals that are flower visitors that contribute to pollination, such as butterflies, beetles, flies, um, and insects are our largest animal group, right? And so it's really hard to say, do this one thing or do that one thing. We have to think about this as a systems approach. And there's an, always exceptions in the insect world as well. Just a reminder that when we think about bees in particular, one of the most familiar bees is probably the European honeybee, important um, agricultural pollinator, but it is an introduced species and it's, although it's the most familiar, it's not a typical bee. So the things we know about uh, honeybees don't apply to a lot of other native bee species. So honeybees have a social lifestyle. They have a colony with a queen. Uh, division of labor, worker bees, and drones. They have multiple generations per year. They're domesticated, managed for crop pollination, honey production, hive products. Um, they're bred and manipulated to be exploited by people for these reasons. Um, and they're not at risk of extinction, although we are seeing some localized problems, especially with winter declines and disease issues. And keeping honeybees is not a conservation strategy. If it is your hobby, that's, that's fine. We're not discouraging that on a small scale, but it really isn't contributing to the decline of these other pollinators, right? So if you wanna help bees, you need to take some of the actions we're gonna talk about today. One of the first things we need to do when we're thinking about habitat is understanding what's gonna use that habitat what these animals look like. And with these creatures being very small, it's a little bit more difficult, right? So we have a ton of native bees, 3,600 in um, our area in the US here, and they all look different. Um, they, don't, they don't look like the honeybee, that typical amber and black striped torpedo shaped body form. We have some bees that are shiny and green that like this metallic sweat bee, might be confused as a fly. Bumblebees are those big fuzzy striped yellow and black striped patterns that people are mostly familiar with. You can see here 
and down here. We have these really, really, really tiny black bees. Um, they might look like gnats. They might look like little flies. They're only a couple millimeters big, but they do, like you can see this bee here is carrying a lot of pollen on its leg. So they do have a big impact in, um, when it comes to pollination. And then it runs the gamut. So what you're seeing on the plant needs to be identified or at least narrowed down to that species that you think you want to conserve and what that might look like. Other uh, insects, like I said, will be visiting these flowers. And when you're looking at this, you know, in your yard or in the field and these animals are moving around from plant to plant, it becomes really hard. So right now, the point of this is just understanding that there is a diversity of pollinators and they may need different things when it comes to their habitat and life cycles. And they need landscape scale conservation. So these animals are not isolated in, in a lot of cases to certain areas. They are mobile, they can fly. Um, they fly different distances depending on the species. And so they use different parts of our landscape, right? And here in America, only three to 5% of the landscape is undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. That is such a small percentage. So we wanna really encourage people to think about that um, going forward, how we live, how we manage the places where we work and play, and how we can stop the loss of biodiversity. So pollinators need your help. And it's a big issue and there's a lot of factors and some of these are interacting and overlapping. And while this situation may seem bleak, you really have more power than you think in this situation. Creating habitat is one of the most important actions we can take. Unlike some other animals that have minimum area requirements for suitable habitats, such as ground nesting birds that may need, you know, hundreds of acres or very large contiguous areas of habitat, pollinators, you know, can thrive in different scales. So while you may not be able to contribute to the conservation of other species, species conservation when it comes to pollinators is easy to do. You can do it at a small scale and large scales. Local efforts make big impacts and there's also additional benefits to creating these habitats. Right. So whether you're in the backyard or the back 40, pollinator habitat has to include the things that all species need. Food, such as nectar, pollen, and host plants. Shelter, that includes nest sites, overwintering sites. We're not always thinking about what pollinators are doing in the winter, but we should be. And then refuge from disturbance. Protection from pesticide risk and that hab habitat disturbance, so things like mowing, tillage, um, other land management practices, and then how we can support pollinators throughout their life cycle. You know, the fun time to think about pollinators is in the summer, spring, you know, in, that, in the growing season when flowers are blooming and we can see them flying around on plants, we can see butterflies, we can see and enjoy that activity, enjoy the flowers but a lot of these animals spend most of their lifetime in their nests, right? So we have to think about having all of the parts in, in these habitats to support animals through their entire life cycle. Otherwise, we're just giving them a part of what they need and they're going to have to look elsewhere for the rest. So we're gonna talk about some of the parameters we need to think about. And the first one is plant selection. I often get the question, what should I plant? You should visit our um, website here. The Xerces Society website has a regional pollinator conservation resource center page where there is a map and you could click on your region and get region specific plant lists for both native bees, for monarch butterflies and other animals, other pollinators. And this is what it looks like inside. It gives you some information on the color, the bloom period, the height, and then some notes on the plant. This helps you pick species that are appropriate for your site conditions, that are native to your area, and that are um, <clears throat> in line with those animals and what they need, right? So 
We want to also make sure that we're picking species with high pollinator value. Not all flowers are created equal. We'll talk about that in a couple slides. We want to have in these habitats a succession of bloom periods. Um, and depending on the size, that may look different, but plants that bloom spring all the way through summer and fall to support those animals that are active during that period. So we have some bees that forage in the spring and are dormant in the summer. We have some that are more active in summer and fall. And then we have species like bumblebees that forage all season long. So we wanna make sure that that food is available throughout the season, including butterfly host plants, making sure you match those plants with site appropriate characteristics. Sometimes there's plants that we might really, really, really love, but if you're trying to force it into um, an area where it doesn't grow well, you might be disappointed at how that plant establishes or the health of that plant might be compromised. The ease of establishment, availability and cost. You may say, Kelly, out of all the plants on your lists, I do not see this. Why does Xerces not list that plant? Maybe it's very hard to get. Um, and you know, we want this to be easy and adoptable. So Sending somebody on a wild goose chase for plants they can't find can be frustrating, although please do include those plants if you know of them. And also sourcing pesticide free seeds or plants is really important. So this is what that season long bloom may look like um, in the, at least in our area here in the mid Atlantic and Northeast. In the early season, our earliest blooms are spring ephemeral wildflowers, then trees and shrubs. So they make up the, the good um, bloom periods for the spring. Moving into summer, we have a lot of choices. Um, things like milkweed, baptisia, lupin. You can see here some native thistle, blueberry. Um, just a ton of examples that make up that bloom period. And then moving into the fall, our landscapes are typically dominated by asters, goldenrod, ironweed, which are really important for those insects that are getting ready to overwinter, important for migrating uh, monarch butterflies that need to stop and refuel. Even honeybees use these plants to build up that end of season nectar store to be able to survive the winter. So I'm just gonna go through some pictures to show you what this looks like in our landscape. So here's those ephemeral wildflowers, red bud, an example of a tree that blooms early here. In the summer, we see things like Monarda, Black-Eyed Susan, Coneflower, Echinacea or Purple Coneflower here. And in the fall, we start seeing things like Ironweed, Rattlesnake Master, moving into Goldenrod, Asters, and alike. Including uh, butterfly host plants is very important. Here I'm using the example of native milkweeds for monarchs. The caterpillars need to develop on the leaves of monarchs. That's their caterpillar food. So they need that as the larval stage. And then also they'll nectar on those plants in the adult stage. In fact, an enormous diversity of plants, uh, of insects use milkweed. Um, including beneficial insects like lady beetles, parasitic wasps, surfid flies, other bees, other pollinators, other butterflies. So they're really a plant that packs a punch if you had to select one for your landscape. Native grasses and sedges tend to be overlooked, I think. These plants give these habitats structure. They add functional groups. They provide overwintering sites. Uh, bumblebees like to nest in, uh, in the cavities under bunch grasses in that tussock. They provide structural diversity, reduce erosion, and help with other things like infiltrating um, water, water infiltration, holding the soil, things like that. So they have a lot of conservation benefits. As I mentioned, all plants aren't created equal. Just because they're a flower doesn't mean they're going to support pollinators. You see here these garden varieties, these cultivars are ornamental. You may like them for other reasons and you may plant them for other reasons, but if you plant these and anticipate that to boost pollinators in your landscape or your yard or your park, you're not gonna see that compared to some of the plants, our native plants that we have on our lists. These plants often uh, with the showy double petals 
or other aesthetic um, features, right? Take away resources that are in the straight species. So petals in place of anthers, these plants have little or no pollen, nectar may be inaccessible, a bee doesn't know how to work that flower to access those resources, or it's too hidden in the flower in this new shape that has occurred from the breeding process. These plants often are not locally adapted. Um, and again, more likely to see these ornamental varieties in a um, big box nursery being treated with insecticides. We also want to consider nesting and overwintering sites. I mentioned earlier, grasses are good for um, some of that, but we have things like you can see in the back here, these crevices and rock walls, things like that are really important uh, habitat features for these animals. About 70% of our native solitary bees nest underground, so not like honeybees at all, right? They're fixed in the landscape, they cannot be moved. This is what their nest sites look like from above, kind of like anthills. I stand and watch to see if a bee comes back and forth. But since this is just a single family, right, not a colony, these are solitary species, it's a female, like you see here, excavating the nest, laying eggs, foraging, bringing back food such as pollen and provisioning that nest. So she makes several trips, hundreds of trips back and forth to the nest to raise her young. So you often have to wait a while to see her coming and going. She's literally a busy bee. Um, to protect these, it's hard to create these. Bees choose where to go. You often see them, you might see them nesting in an aggregation, especially for our spring bees. You might see several nest holes in one area and a lot of activity, maybe some males kind of swarming around waiting for females to come out and mate. A lot of people think these are wasps and they spray them. You do not need to do that. These are very uh, docile bees. They're not aggressive. They don't sting. They go away. They go dormant in the summer. Um, and so there's no risk there, right? So please recognize the difference between this and a wasp nest, which is more active later in the season. And that's when wasps are aggressive. In the spring, we don't see a lot of wasp activity. The other 30% of our native species um, nest in uh, stems or wood cavities like you see here. So species with hollow or soft pits, they'll either adopt a hollow stem or excavate a stem that's soft in the middle. And again, they'll be laying eggs in there. They'll create little chambers and they'll put pollen, a pollen ball and lay an egg on it, close that chamber off and create another one and another one and another one. And these are little nurseries for the next uh, generation of bees. So we definitely want to make sure that we're protecting and providing these so that we could continue to boost those populations of bees that we'll see in the following season. And we have information on that on our website. But typically we want to leave flower stalks intact in the winter. So, you know, this is the time people tend to be cleaning up or winterizing their gardens. Leave some stems like you see in this picture here. Um, but don't cut them, leave them over the winter, and then cut them in early spring. That way the bees that are overwintering or nesting in those um, can remain throughout the winter season. When they emerge in the spring, you could cut those to a variety of heights between 8 to 24 inches, and likely they'll be readopted. Um, these stems will break down as new growth comes in for perennial plants, so you don't need to clean them up, right? They will disappear. Sna uh, snags, logs, and stumps. We'll also look at examples of those and how they benefit um, nesting habitats. Our bumblebees are our social bee species here. We have about 45 in the US. They nest in a variety of places depending on species, mostly above ground, but some in underground cavities such as abandoned rodent burrows. Um, a lot of times they're in overgrown areas like unmown field edges in those grass tussocks, uh, brush piles on the edge of forests, old rodent burrows I mentioned, um, tree cavities, hollow logs, rock piles, old junk cars, uh, your compost pile you may have seen them in. So they're very opportunistic. They need a warm insulated cavity. So put that all together and this is what these features might look like. Here's some downed logs, here's some standing stems, 
protected ground, right? That's not mowed or tilled. Um, but how would we incorporate these into our you know, neighborhoods and cities and towns? It might look a little different than these natural areas. And again, maintaining that winter cover. So we could see here, and I see a lot of uh, neighborhoods or developments or areas that may look like this. And of course our cityscapes are, are very hard surfaced. So how can we bring these features into our cities and towns? Obviously this picture looks like it does not have any of those features, <laughs> unfortunately. And we need to rethink, it, rethink that, right? We need to be part of the system as well. Meadow habitat is a popular option that people are becoming more interested in. This is what we do a lot in our open um, habitat projects on farms, rangeland, other areas where we have big spaces. But this can also apply to residential areas. So here you see um, a housing community and all of this lovely pen stem in. So this is a uh, white beard stem or tall beard stem. Here's a close up. You can also see spiderwort and other species in there, giving a nice blanket of spring bloom. I think this looks absolutely gorgeous, especially con compared to the previous picture. I'd be sitting on my deck out there watching the activity, bees and butterflies and flowers. Trees and shrubs are often overlooked um, because people like this idea of a meadow but they're very valuable uh, components of habitat. As I mentioned earlier, they're important for that early bloom. Right? So we wanna make sure we have those incorporated into our landscapes as well. And unlike um, a wildflower that may have a single stem with a flower on it, picture a blooming tree or shrub. They're so floriferous. I mean, they have about an acre's worth of flowers just on one plant. And that really is beneficial to pollinators because they don't have to fly here and then fly over here to another stem and then find a flower, you know, five feet in, in the other direction. They could continue to forage flower to flower to flower that are really close together on a tree or shrub and that increases foraging efficiency. They're able to collect more food and bring more food back to the nest in a shorter amount of time, right? So less stops at the local floral markets. And these can be combined into landscapes, um, hedgerows, screens along lanes like you see here. Uh, this is actually in a residential area where we have some spring blooming trees, again, red buds, some dogwood, there's that flowering ground cover. And these are really great options for long linear areas um, because where you can't build habitat out like you would with one of those meadows I showed, you can really build habitat vertically, right? And so you can get a lot of different niches in here if you have a herbaceous layer, grass or wildflowers at the bottom, right? A tree or a tr small tree and shrub layer in that mid story, and then this canopy layer, right? That divides, that creates that habitat stratification for different animals. Um, for bees and for birds. You know, we have birds that like to live in the canopy, birds that like to live in the shrub layer. Oops, I think I just did something there. So those look like big landscapes and you may be thinking, I don't have that kind of space to deal with, which is fine. You don't need large acreage to make a difference. Like I said, we can do pollinator conservation in small spaces. This is the community center in my town here. They've installed a native rain garden with flowering plants. Um, I like it. it has these other features too, like this wood um, nesting feature here, this log, right? And so, the same big concepts apply when you do this on a small scale. We just have to scale them down. There are some considerations I'll go over for small gardens and small spaces. Um, but again, we wanna have native plants with a range of bloom periods, um, non-native naturalized species, some of our garden herbs, um, some of our ornamental wildflowers, things like cosmos can be incorporated here. Um, we don't wanna plant those in wild areas where, they, where we risk having them escape into you know, unique habitats, but they're fine in garden spaces where they can be controlled. Um, but we certainly wanna avoid planting invasive species, things like butterfly bushes, um, although very attractive to butterflies 
is not a good plant to have in our landscape. We have much better native options. <clears throat> so when you're working in small spaces, here are some guidelines. Um, select a few of the best species. You may see some of our habitat mixes, our seed mixes on our website have 20 plus species. If you have a small area, reduce the number of species. You don't want just one of every plant. You want these clumps flowering at one time, again, to increase that foraging efficiency. Avoid aggressive species, um, things like Canada goldenrod or um, <clears throat> Monarda fistulosa, they are great pollinator plants, but if you put them in the small space, especially if you plant a lot of it, it's going to spread and it's going to take out other plants. So it'll reduce the diversity of plants in your small space. Include those native bunch grasses. Um, what that might look like is two to five plants of each flowering species clumped and then two to three plants of grasses or sedges clumped. Right? And that depends on the spread. If you have a plant that is going to have a larger spread than others, you may want to reduce that, maybe just have one. Um, locally sourced open pollinated seed grown plants are the best option, right? Those are the ones that will bring genetic diversity to our landscapes. Clones, again, often do not provide those resources for pollinators. Um, pick a few of the best plants that match your site. Here's another example here. Plant lower growing species along walkways, driveways, areas that need to be kept clear or where you need a line of sight. Um, taller plants tend to flop over into these areas. So if you have an open space with these tall, especially our tall herbaceous wildflowers, they might flop over because there's no structure holding them up on that side. Maintaining a border and edge is really important. It makes it look neat and purposeful. We'll have some examples of that. And include features for yourself to enjoy the gardens. Benches, sitting areas, signs, um, walkways, pathways, whatever that may be. And then have some negative space too. What we wanna move away from is um, having too much lawn or this uh, you know, concept of gardening where we're tending to individual plants like specimen trees um, or that old European style of gardening or having these you know, evenly spaced meatball type shrubs. That's not habitat, that doesn't create good habitat. We need to think of the whole picture and how that works together versus the individual plants, right? And lawn conversion, which people mentioned that they were interested in the poll earlier, is really a humongous opportunity for us to increase habitat, increase landscape biodiversity, and increase the resilience and sustainability of our landscapes, right? Turf is the single largest irrigated crop in the country. We have over 40 million acres of it. <laughs> um, it supports far fewer pollinators, beneficial insects, songbirds, and uh, flowering plants do. It is often a, um, you know, a system that is more prone to pests, and it has about the habitat value of a parking lot, right? So do, creating something like you see here on the right side, where you do still have some lawn, some open space, that's fine, but maybe you have a border of flowering shrubs, these herbaceous plants, a variety of different species, some vines and taller species in the back here where you have support for them. I think this just, I think it's beautiful. I think it adds a lot of aesthetics to our landscapes. It beautifies the area. It's less um, mowing and fuel use and pollution um, compared to managing lawns, right? So we need to kind of throw away that old land management <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, concept and get to a something that's a little bit more sustainable and pollinator friendly. Here's another example, right? This has again all those different functional groups, ground cover, flowers, trees, shrubs, ferns. Um, you can include things that benefit you, you know, um, things like fruiting and flowering trees and shrubs, things that you could eat, right? A food garden, Blueberry, raspberry, elderberry, currant, serviceberry, apple, all of those plants have a really high pollinator value. 
garden herbs. You may see this in your own gardens. Things like mint, cilantro, dill, lovage, oregano, borge are just covered in pollinators. These are also climate smart options, right? Planting native plants that are drought tolerant instead of things that you need to water or fertilize. Um, that just increases the resilience to climate change, conserves water resources, reduces the chemical load um, or input load into our um, residential systems, into the home, into the water. So these are really important concepts to consider. And again, I think this looks much more beautiful, right? This can also be applied in other parts of your landscape. So when you're thinking about how to engage your local governments, um, or you know, just your community in general, you know, mention, hey, when we're doing landscaping in these public areas, can we prioritize a diversity of native plants, right? These native plants will be more resilient to fluctuating conditions. Um, we can pick species that will tolerate you know, a wet season. If you have an area that tends to have flooding or standing water part of the season, but dries up in other parts of the season, we have plants that will tolerate those fluctuations, right? And we can go really small here. These are office gardens. Um, this is on this side here on the left, you see a Monarch Way station. This is packed with caterpillars, even though it's just a small mulch bed on the side of an office building. And this is my office here, that's my window. So I get to look out and watch bees visiting these plants. Um, and they're chock full of pollinators. This is what I do on break. I go out, look at the plants, take pictures. I see a huge diversity of, of insects visiting. This can have other applications too. These plants are great for rain gardens and bioswales. They can capture runoff. They reduce water pollution. Here is just a small native plant garden outside of a sports bar. Um, adds a little flair to the parking lot as well. And this is, again is an, another feature in our office where we have these um, rain gardens that capture rain as they pour down this part of the drive which is sloped. Detention ponds and basins, if you have these in your landscape or your community, you know, planting native plants around the edges. I often see them mowed to the edges but you can use native plants in those areas to beautify it, maybe to screen it a little and also provide that habitat value. There's no sizes too small, right? These sidewalk strips may look tiny, but if they're continuous down the whole street, that really adds a lot of habitat value to that area. Including nesting features. So here you see some gardens with these snags. Here's tree snags in the back. These are very, very small. This is a community garden here. Um, it's not much bigger than what you see shown in the picture. This is more of a linear setup here that includes trees, shrubs, milkweed plants, and, and other um, herbaceous wildflowers, including some naturalized species. But having these nesting habitat features is really important. You know, we need these uh, features combined in one spot to really support that life cycle I was mentioning earlier. And it gives it a nice little kind of uh, structural element, focal points, very nice. You may not see these animals nesting, but I assure you they are there. Here's a backyard snag that somebody created um, and nesting on in that in these little holes that were pre-drilled by other animals like beetles. Uh, we find our wood nesting bees. So this is our metallic green sweat bee Agricora pura, and it is a wood nester, right? So very, very, very tall. If you're looking for it, only a couple of millimeters here. It looks nice and big in these blown up pictures, but sit and watch. You will see them coming and going. Uh, a lot of these features may um, people may have the impression that it is messy, unkept, unmanaged, but it, they're really, really, really important habitat features. Right? Here's what it might look like, herbaceous stems. This is a, a little uh, bramble patch, raspberries and blackberries here. They have those hollow pith stems for nesting, right? 
So you can see here, there's a little bee butt in, hanging out of that stem. She'll be going back and forth again, provisioning the nest, laying eggs, creating those little nursery chambers and filling those nests up with bees that'll emerge the next season. So keeping these features is easy. It's an easy thing to do and it's very, very important. Leaving the leaves. Um, so we have a lot of um, moths and butterflies and other insects that will attach themselves inside of rolled up leaves, a little insulation for the winter. Um, it provides cover for anything that might be overwintering at the ground level or in, the so in pockets in the soil. Right? So leaving a thin layer is really important. Spreading them on a flower bed can be an option. You could double, you could have a double use as mulch. You could pile them around ornamental trees and shrubs. Um, if you can, avoid shredding them or the worst case um, is, you know, putting them in a perfectly biodegradable material into a plastic bag and sending it to the dump. Um, there are millions of of tons of yard waste sent to the dump <laughs> a year. And that is really not a great use of these biogradable materials that really um, need to stay in our landscape, not just for habitat features, but for nutrient cycling and other things. So again, if you had to pick things, this can be an easy option for people that don't have the other options, right? Oh, that got cut off a little. Make sure you have that all season interest again. Things blooming in summer, things blooming in fall, and those stems and stalks left for the winter. It looks so much more beautiful when snow falls on standing vegetation and stems um, than just the lawn. Gives you some nice texture. And also these seeds are really important in the winter for birds. So you'll see birds feeding on those as well. Put a sign in your habitat or your garden, wherever you may be and say, hey, this is something, you know, don't disturb this, don't mow, don't spray. This is set aside habitat for pollinators. It's here for a reason. These signs are especially helpful when you're um, implementing these gardens <clears throat> because it may look messy for a while as you build on, you know, installing those plants, getting those features in there. And people may think, oh, what's going on there? Maybe they're not taking care of it. It looks bad. It looks unkept. This will tell people, oh, look, they're doing something. You know, they're taking out their lawn and they're making it into pollinator habitat. And if we all take these small individual actions, it can really add to um, a lot of benefit for these animals, right? So here's the bird's eye view, or I should say the bee's eye view of a neighborhood. You know, if we all have these features in our yards or on the edges, along the sidewalk, wherever it may be, we can have these, you know, um, pollinator friendly neighborhoods, flowering shrubs, shade loving plants where they belong, little pocket prairies like I showed before, um, ground nesting bee sites, less disturbance, less mowing, cavity nesting areas. Another action you can take is, um, you know, Getting a committee together in your community, join forces with the other like-minded gardeners and people that care about conservation or environmental groups like your local green team and work towards becoming a bee city. So this is a Xerce Society program, Bee City and Bee Campus USA, um, where we work with you to kind of sustain pollinators, help you create a community action plan give you the resources you need to implement that. And you, know, you can take actions such as restoring native plant communities, um, educating the public, doing outreach, reducing pesticide use um, in, in your landscape, right at home. And then you can get um, accredited as a bee city or a bee campus. So this is a nice way to kind of motivate people to do this. Okay. <clears throat> Here are our uh, current bee city and campuses. You can see we have quite a few. We would really like to add some more, so please get it, be a dot on the map. Okay. And if you wanna learn more about any single one of the individual topics I mentioned today, please visit our website, 
view our other webinars. I mean, each of these topics can be its own webinar. So today was a high level overview to give you some ideas. I encourage you to reach out to me or somebody at Xerces Society for more help. Um, but we have a lot of content online that can get you started. Here again, just a reminder about the Resource Center, the regional um, resources that are available to you. Here's a picture of some of them. We have everything from you know, large books that cover these topics in depth, to plant lists, to individual habitat guides. Check them out. If you cannot find something you're looking for on our website, email me directly and I will help you. Uh, most likely we have it, it's just hard to find. Um, and if you need more ideas, you can look at our community science programs and opportunities. They're also on our website. Um, if it is um, something, if all of these actions are something that you cannot take, you can support the uh, Xerces Society directly by becoming a member. We are a member supported organization. You know, we rely on donations and grant funding to do this work, both at large and small scales for all of our programs. So you can support the work we do to help um, our landscapes become more resilient, more climate friendly, and support pollinators and reduce these risks and these declines that we're seeing. So there are small actions we can all take that really add up to become substantial, and I encourage you to do so. With that, I will take questions. Um, if we have any here. We do. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> that was a great presentation. I love these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, That's the great. pictures really tell the story. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, All right, so a few people have questions about milkweed plants specifically um, and monarch populations. This person said they planted six native milkweed plants a year ago and they thrived this year, but they haven't seen a single monarch or, or caterpillar and they're wondering what went wrong. On, on their milkweed or just in general? I think on their milkweed. Okay, um, so sometimes caterpillars prefer um, younger plants, so newly emerged plants that have more tender foliage. But in general, we just see fluctuations in where, you know, where they're laying eggs, where the adults are laying eggs, where caterpillars are feeding. So you may see that over space and time, um, and that's normal. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to exactly what was happening um, in your yard, it could be a lot of factors um, that, that, you know, can't be necessarily explained by me without being there or knowing, <laughs> knowing more about your landscape. So I'm sorry, but yeah, seeing fluctuations is normal. We, I have seen less monarchs too this year, but I have talked to other people that say they've seen more. So. Thank you. Um, this other person asked if they should cut their milkweed down at the end of the season. Um, I typically don't cut the milkweed down. I will leave those standing stems, um, especially as uh, for at least the um, amount of time it takes those pods to mature and break open because that sends seeds out into the environment so that plant could continue to reseed itself or you could collect those seeds and replant um, to get more milkweed stems. Uh, I usually leave them. Uh, I don't know if there's any benefit to cutting them, but I, if, I, if it were me, I would leave them standing. Yeah. Okay, great. Just reading through the questions here. <clears throat> this is a honeybee question. Um, they, um, this woman said that she's seen a spike in honeybees in their, wild, um, their wildflower garden. And she's just wondering if she should take any action to remove them so they aren't competing with native pollinators or are we not at that point yet? So they can, honeybees can compete with, with native pollinators in different ways. They can compete for resources. So if you bring a, high, a hive or multiple hives to an area where there are a lot of nectar plants, right? You're moving in you know, 20 to 50,000 bees 
honeybees that can go out and you know strip those resources that other pollinators may need um, you know and they can do that in a short amount of time those forages are really efficient and there's also risk of disease spillover so you know similar to like sharing a, a coffee cup or something <laughs> with with a human when bees share flowers honeybees can uh, transmit certain diseases to native species um, those are risks we see when we have a, a lot of hives, especially in natural areas. So we don't really um, promote doing that. But I'm, I'm afraid to say it sounds like somebody near you has a hive. And although you could you know, continuously remove those particular bees from your yard because they are species that reproduce rapidly and have multiple generations per year and have, you know, several thousand bees in one hive, you'll likely see them, you know, just coming back over and over and over again. Um, so I don't know if there's somewhere, you know, somebody that has a new hive in your area that maybe you can say, hey, <laughs> you know, plant more flowers in your own, in your own yard. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it can be a concern, especially when we have high numbers of hives in natural areas that are, are unique or you know, really, really supportive to our native species. All right, on to the next question. Lots of questions about overwintering sites and stems using stems. So this person is asking if they have a specific overwintering site section in their yard would it work to stand up vertically a variety of lengths of plant stalks from cone flower, sunflower, et cetera? They have flopped over in their garden beds and some have broken at the bottom. They're standing up the stalks around partially buried sections of oak tree limbs and branches as well as a stand of little blue stem. Great, so I, you know, if, so some of these features, you know, especially if you have stumps or wood or, or something like that, you might not, you know, in certain neighborhoods, it might not be something that you can or want to put, you know, front and center in your front yard, but certainly having them tucked away nearby is, is an option. You know, if you have an area that's less visible, maybe behind the garage or by the shed, something like that, um, that, is, that is acceptable. Taller species will flop if they are in a shallow garden bed. Um, and in that case, you know, or if you are pruning the stems for whatever reason in the fall, if you really, really feel like you have to, you know, pruning them, cutting them in, in lengths, in large lengths and bundling them up and leaving them outside. So anything that's in them may have the chance of emerging, you know, the next season. <clears throat> Um, is, is a good compromise. And, you know, some things, you know, some stems do fall over and break and, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but having, you know, if you collect them, if there's a bunch of them and you want to bundle them up and set them aside rather than, you know, burning them or trash bagging them or something else, that's, you know, that's what we would definitely recommend. Another question, and someone's asking if they have to cut the stems or can they just leave stems and bees will make holes to access? So, yeah, so they need an access point, right? So it is good to cut them or if you don't want to go out and, you know, get shears and actually be snipping them at, you know, that way. Um, what I like to do is when I see those plants that do have those stems, when I'm walking through a field, I'm just going around and kind of just breaking the tops off myself to give them an entry point. Um, so that, that is an important question. Um, so I like to leave mine standing. I don't do the annual pruning, but I will break tips off. So there is an entrance point for those bees to access. And some of them will excavate that material in the middle. They'll actually dig it out, chew it out and make you know, that hollow area for the, the nesting chamber. Okay, great. I like this question. <clears throat> um, this person is saying that a lot of the photos that you had in gardens to appear to be in full sun. Are there mm -hmm. supporting species that are more shade tolerant? Um, they do have some sun. But they also have a lot of shade and have um, and dabbled shade because there's two huge pine oaks and an old holly tree on their property. 
Yes, so we do have um, some things for shade. You know, these are species that we often see um, on forest edges. Uh, things like big leaf aster, Solomon seal, some of our shade, um, more shade tolerant shrubs are an option there. Uh, things like viburnum are a good option for that. They're a little bit more shade tolerant than say something like a red bud tree, which needs a little bit more sun. Um, if you contact me and let me know a little bit more about what type of plants you're looking for, and what your conditions are, I can send you a, a list of shade tolerant pollinator plants. Um, as long as they're getting a little bit of sun, uh, that, that should be fine. So, you know, in, these insects tend to be more active in, in open areas, but we do have a lot, especially in our region, of forest associated bees that live on that more shady edge. All right. Um, there's one Karen that has a lot of really good questions in here. Um, so this is more of a, a township question, city question. So she said that her town collects um, it, the leaves in the fall for composting into a large area that's set aside for them, then makes the compost available to residents in the spring and asking if the insects will survive this process. Yeah, um, actually, it, it, that's a great way to um, not be chopping up leaves, to use that material in a way that's, you know, responsible. Uh, and when it, as it gets warm in those compost piles, insects actually like that. They like to get in there um, and have that warmer space. So, so long as they're not chopping them up, um, which people might often do for compost because it will degrade faster, that, that's a, a good compromise. Um, I don't know how they're managed once they get to the township site, but I would encourage that. Unfortunately, our, our neighborhood doesn't do that, but I wish they would come and collect them um, and use them for composting themselves, you know, or let residents have them. All right, good to know. <clears throat> so this question is a little bit more about um, rural habitat, but I think it's a good one. Uh, how would you go about assessing an existing hedgerow between crop fields to analyze to see if it needs habitat enhancement in ways that the hedgerow can produce more benefit to its crop fields? Right. Um, <clears throat> so we have, have what we, ha we have habitat assessment guides on our website. We have them for parks, yards, um, and, and neighborhoods, kind of those smaller spaces. So check that out. That's a useful planning tool. If, if anybody is interested in that, you know, I can go over it with you. We can do that you know, outside of this webinar. Um, so that may be a way. There's checklists included in that. We also have uh, habitat um, evaluation guides for agricultural landscapes, um, more of a rangeland and pasture system, and we have them for beneficial insects as well. So the, the ones I already mentioned are for pollinators. So that may give you an idea, but just looking at how that's managed, um, you know, that diversity of species, does it need species, you know, sometimes we'll add more robust wildflowers to a woody hedgerow, things like goldenrod, um, sunflower, milkweed to provide that summer and fall bloom if it's dominated by early blooming species. Adding those grasses for that, you know, ground cover for that herbaceous layer for that nesting. How is it managed? So, you know, is there reduced disturbance? If it's in agricultural areas, is there a risk of insecticide contamination? Can we somehow reduce that risk by creating a buffer or having a no spray zone between that and where the pesticides or insecticides are being applied or eliminate them totally, which would be the ideal situation. Um, but I can help with that. that, that are, that's things that we do on a normal basis. That's part of our planning process. So if you would like more information, um, contact me and we, we could talk about that look at what's in there and then identify opportunities to enhance it. Great, thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. 
This person lives on a horse farm and she said that her landlord said that milkweed is poisonous to horses. Um, anything else that they can plant or a different type of milkweed? Yeah, so we do have, um, you know, they, they do have to eat a, a lot of it, but certainly we do not want to even present that risk. So when we're in that type of system where there is risk to livestock, you know, we use those plants maybe on the borders of the, of the pasture or other areas, um, <clears throat> but there are plenty of flowering legumes that um, might even benefit horses. I'm not a livestock person, so I'd have to look that up. But as far as monarch host plants go, there aren't any other options. That's, you know, milkweed, the family of milkweeds is their obligate host. They need to feed on that to develop. Um, you know, they won't, they won't develop on other plants properly. So um, lots of other options for nectar plants, which is a great way to support adult monarchs um, and, and other pollinators, but we do need to be careful with certain plants when we have um, livestock involved because we do want to avoid poisoning those animals. All right, this next question, this person is asking um, specifically about timing of removing species. So they have a diverse uh, group of native bees, ground nesting, pithy stem, et cetera, but they needed to, this year they need to sort of edit their garden. They have lots aster goldenrods taking over and they're asking if it's best to try and remove them now in the fall or next spring because they don't want to disturb ground nesting bees. Right so I guess it depends on on how you're going to be removing them and how many bees are nesting there but you know again you can clip them at the base I mean, the best time to start trying to cut them down or re remove them, um, you know, if you're mowing, the best time to do that to reduce those plants would be when they're flowering, you know, um, that's when they're sending energies through the plants, through the vascular system. So, or if you're pulling them, uh, you know, just do it as gently as you can. Uh, there's, there's no way to move a ground nest, but you can reduce that disturbance. If there are plants that are used by stem nesting bees, you can bundle them again and set them aside in an area to biodegrade naturally and have those um, animals emerge. All right, so we have a few minutes, so I'll um, okay. do a couple more questions. We have a few questions about yellow jackets specifically. Um, okay. Some folks are saying that they know they're beneficial, but they chase them around in their garden and they don't um, know if they should dig out their nest. Another person um, sprayed them because they have kids around and they didn't want the kids to get stung, wondering if the spray is bad for them, if there's anything else they could have done, et cetera. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, um, our ground nesting wasps like yellow jackets definitely give bees a bad name. They are beneficial because unlike, you know, unlike bees, they, they provision their nest, but they provision it with live prey. And oftentimes these are things like uh, insect pests in your food gardens, caterpillars, things like that. So they can provide, you know, that natural pest control or suppression. But at the end of the season, you know, they start running out of food sources, um, you know, they're, they get a little more aggressive, their colonies are at their peak, you know, this time of year, a little earlier, around this time of year and a little earlier. So when you run into these adults nectaring on flowers, so they switch their um, diets from that stage when they're developing and eating other insects, so from carnivores to flower feeders as adults, when they're on the flower, they're not aggressive, right? They're not defending that flower. When they're in the nest, they have this nest defense behavior to protect the colony, right? It's just animal instincts. And that's when you really find them um, <laughs> becoming aggressive, being a risk to dogs and kids. So if you find nests, marking them off and staying away from them, um, a lot of people do if they are at high risk or if they do have allergy issues, they will use um, you know, insecticide or wasp spray or call a landscaping company. I don't think you can dig them out. Um, so, and I wouldn't encourage you to try 
because that can be very, very dangerous. Um, so reducing disturbance around them is really what we can do. And there's no really way to tell them where to go. I wish we could. I wish we could say, hey, nest in that area over there that's out of the way. But oftentimes these animals don't pick those best areas. So if you're running over it with a lawnmower or if it's in a high traffic area, um, it can be definitely dangerous, unfortunately. All right, so on that same sort of line of thought, um, we do have a question about bumblebee nesting. So not, uh, hun <laughs> not uh, aggressive bees, but they have a bumblebee nest in the wood of their house and they're wondering how they can relocate them without hurting them. So bumblebees um, are annual, right? They're an, unlike honeybees, they don't overwinter with the queen um, for next spring. What's happening right now is the majority of that bumblebee colony, so old foragers will be dying off. New bees will be mating and they'll be a mated queen and they'll overwinter that way. So only those mated queens at the end of the season, the bees that mate at the end of the season, they'll leave the nest and they will hibernate in, in what we call hibernaculum and that is not the same location as the nest, they'll find another protected area. So over the winter, if you go in and remove, you know, the, the if there is leftover nest material and you want to remove that and clean it up, winter is the best time, and then plug up any of those access points. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and, and maybe you're taught, if you do see something year after year, it might be carpenter bees which are a little different than bumblebees. All right, thank you, Kelly. So that's just about what we have time for today. Uh, Kelly was nice enough to offer her email address if you have more specific questions. Feel free to reach out. Definitely check out our website and all of our resources. I just wanna thank you so much, Kelly, for your time and for being here today and a great presentation.